If you enjoy this content, please take a moment to rate and review it. Your feedback will greatly impact our ability to reach more people. Thank you. All right. So uh, welcome back to our guest series here at Health Further. Vic and I always uh, trying to educate ourselves, make ourselves smarter by bringing the smartest people in healthcare innovation yeah. to the show. And uh, today, really happy to have my friend, uh, colleague who is uh, in the Aspen Health Innovators Fellowship with me, Ambar Bhattacharya, who is a managing partner at Maverick Ventures. Ambar, how are you doing, man? Doing great. I'm so excited to finally be on the pod. This is awesome. <laughs> I know. We've, we've been trying to make the dates work. Yeah. You're really busy. We've had a bunch of crazy stuff going on. But, man, thank you so much for making time for, for us. You, you you probably don't even know this, but we have had your work featured on the show. Um, Vic and I, every week when we do our roll-ups, at the end, we've gotten to the to the place where now we spend about 10 minutes yeah. kind of running down AI stories. And I think before we started that 10-minute AI rundown, one of the things we anchored everybody around was, uh, the article you did maybe 10 months ago yeah. uh, on the AI checkup that you, you and a, 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 some of your colleagues do on this Substack, And it was a great sort of framework. It had a, a visual infographic to sort of lay out all the different areas where Gen AI can be effective. So it was a great starting point for us to start our conversation. So thanks for your contribution to the space overall. And uh, yeah, happy to have you on the show, man. Oh, this is great. Well, first of all, thanks for thanks again for having me to uh you know, we we put a lot of time and effort into thinking about these about these spaces in AI, and we can talk more about that in a second. Uh, but we, we, I've always found frameworks help, you know, and so we we've been trying to experiment with them, track them, look for them for consistently uh, for consistency, not just you know amongst investors like 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 you and I, Marcus, but also with other key stakeholders, you know, regulators, customers, startups, physicians, nurses. You know, really try to technologists, engineers, like really get a you know a state of the state, and so you know it's been really fun to you know put to publish some of that, right? It's it's a new skill for 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 me to you know how do you how do you internalize and then um, and communicate some of these findings in a space that is moving exponentially fast, um, and so that's you know it's kind of where we are today. So, Ambar, before I pass off to Vic, because you and I have had multiple conversations, and I want to make sure he gets his questions in. He, he doesn't get to speak to you as often as I do. Uh, I, I was mentioning before we started recording that one of the reasons why I hold you in such high regard a, as it pertains to the intersection of generative AI and healthcare is that in our first Aspen seminar, this was the fall of 2022, so this is pre-chat GPT or any of that kind of stuff, everyone was going around the room kind of saying where they think things are going, what they're really passionate about. And you were the one, not just in that room that time, but I think against the backdrop of all the things that other people were saying in the space to make the statement that AI is going to have huge implications for healthcare specifically. Um, and I, I have to admit, even as a technologist, because ChatGPT hadn't arrived yet, I didn't fully understand where you were coming from. So I think before we dig into where we are now and some of the opportunities, I would love to just understand you, you know, you're based in Silicon Valley. What were you seeing back then? What were you seeing in 2022, maybe even 2021 or 2020? What were you seeing building up to that point that you had already, before the rest of the market got there, built your thesis around the intersection of Gen AI and healthcare? Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll answer with a story, maybe two stories, you know, about, about why, why I got really excited about this early. So um, and they're a little bit of non sequiturs, right? But may, maybe they'll maybe they'll they'll be insightful. So um, maybe about 10, 12 years ago, I, I was I was investing at, at another fund, Bessemer Venture Partners, and we were at the at the back then Bessemer. We were at the forefront of another innovative wave, which was um, in and around how the internet was democratizing. For the average person, um, and they can actually start earning an income off the internet. And so this was, you know, when Uber was starting, DoorDash, um, uh, eBay had already started, like a, you know, a decade ago. But there was a few companies that had started uh, there that were in the Bessemer portfolio: uh, Shopify and Pinterest and Twilio, in particular. 
Hmm. And I was a pretty young, pretty young person um, at that time. I'm still pretty young, but I was even younger, <laughs> younger back then. And one of the ways that I thought about learning about these new tools was trying them. And so I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make a Shopify shop and see what it's like. I'm going to make a Pinterest board and see if, you know, how, how those bookmarks work. I'm going to go on Twilio and set up my own, you know, text, uh, text type thing. We invest in a company called Zapier. And I try to connect my, you know, my, my, my Salesforce updates to getting a text message. It was, it was all like, it was like, how easy is this for the average person? And, uh, and by background, I'm like, I, I learned how to program at a young age, but I'm not a technologist. Like I'm not a software engineer. And what I found was these tools made it so easy to sell things on the internet, create new designs, integrate the web and text. It was so simple. And I was like, holy moly, like, this is going to be awesome. I don't know how big these things could be. And they all ended up way bigger than I could have possibly, possibly imagined. But I think that first person ability to try something and use it gave me that like, wow moment. Uh, so then you fast forward another five years and um, yeah, maybe seven years and, and um, crypto and blockchain started taking off. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, like this could be it, you know, like, and let me go try all these things. And there was all these things called DAOs, like these distributed autonomous organizations and different things being on the blockchain. So I just went through the same exercise, like, oh, like, let me try it, right? Like, I, let me see, like, if this is the same Shopify, Pinterest ex experience that, that I had, like, you know, seven, nine years ago. And I went through it and holy moly, it was not. <laughs> it right, was so right. hard to use. None of it made any sense to me. Uh, we, you know, me and two other, um, two other folks that, you know, that I collaborate with, we started a DAO like ever so briefly. It was like the shortest lived DAO of all time. <laughs> it was really hard <laughs> to figure out what exactly the purpose was. We tried to integrate all this technology. We made all these NFTs. We did all these things and none of it was intuitive. Like none of it made any sense. And I was like, maybe, maybe it's me. I'm at least a little bit older, <laughs> but I think like it, it just wasn't there. You know, it was, it was like in my mind, it was a like technology looking for a problem. Um, and, and I, and I just, I just didn't think it would cross that chasm, at least not that iteration of it. So then you fast forward another four or five years and this AI stuff started coming out. And, um, again, like just my mentality, like I got to try it. Right. And so before chat GPT came out, there were, um, uh, you know, AI existed, right? I mean, there, there was GPT too, right? Um, there was a open AI playground. Um, there were some open source models. Um, there, there were a few different things out there um, that were really, uh, you know, cutting edge, but still usable. And once I started using those things, I was like, holy moly, like this is actually changing the way that one can actually summarize information, search for information. Um, and it was so intuitive. Um, and I started seeing how other folks who were programmers were generating code from it at a really, um, you know, really early time. Uh, and so then I started just calling as many people as I could about this, um, uh, you know, customers, non-customers, just testing these hypotheses now that I, I, I started getting early you know, early conviction that this might be something. And what was fascinating to me was just the myriad of use cases people thought about, not just in healthcare, you know, but just like outside of healthcare, you know, customer service, search, um, uh, you know, virtual friends, you know, virtual therapists. I mean, you can go on and on and on um, writing poetry in, in the beginning of time, like, you know, summarizing Shakespeare, all that stuff. And it totally just captured, you know, my imagination. And given the vast majority of what I do is in healthcare, I think I was able to kind of make that connection between like, yeah, this, this technology, if pointed in the right direction with the right guardrails and, and the right use cases, could have a pretty transformative effect. And so that's kind of what got me jazzed up about it. It was a long answer to your question, but hopefully that that arc, you know, gives you a sense of, of it. It does. It does. I mean, it says to to me that a really two things. One, uh, playing, playing with things early on uh, is is key to how you develop your own views of where the world is heading. And then I guess the second thing is that you have a high um, 
but you 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 rate the value of ease of use very highly. Uh, and, and I think that's a that's a that's probably something that that more VCs should be considering rating very highly, right? Like not not theoretical utility, yeah. but like practical. I played with it. Is it actually easy for me or not? And how do you weigh that into your own decision making process? Yeah, I, mean, I think it goes to the adoption problem, the adoption curve, right? If it's easy to play with, easy to compose into different things, there's lots of potential use cases that could grow into other things. And I think crypto is a good good example where maybe it's okay if you're in another country and you have trouble with your currency. But in the US, I don't have, I mean, yeah, maybe we don't like how inflation is, but it's sub 5% a year. It has been for a long time. And so um, the real like pressure to switch over and all the pain of going through the rotation, and then maybe not worth it. And so that, that maybe is a pretty good uh, metric to decide, is this basic technology going to be adopted at some scale over time or, or not? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of interesting. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That was super helpful. So fast forward to today, um, we're now seeing lots of companies getting lots of rounds done uh, around AI and healthcare. Uh, sort of high level things that I think we're seeing. We see a lot of stuff around clinical models. We see a lot of stuff around workflow uh, and, and workflow efficiency. Mm -hmm. We see ambient technologies. Yeah. Um, I think in a couple of weeks we're going to have Steve Lieber in, who uh, who is is uh, uh, collaborating with Chime and HFMA and a bunch mm -hmm. of other organizations around a standard for smart smart hospitals. Um, and working with care, care AI, et cetera. So those are kind of some some high level themes. But if you had to lay it out for us and for the listeners in terms of a framework, where would you say we are now? High level categories, high level areas of uh, of impact where AI is meaningfully making progress today in healthcare. Yeah, so I'll. I'll state it like this, you know, the framework that we put out um, and updated uh, both, you know, a few quarters ago and then this quarter, uh, we, we looked at it on two different dimensions. One is, you know, technical complexity versus technical simplicity of actually building a product. Um, and then we looked at another dimension of, uh, you know, signs of customer adoption versus how visionary it is in the, in, in the future. And you know what, what? What's interesting if you track that same exact grid over a three-quarter period, uh, a lot of it, uh, we have seen some early adopters on the provider and payer side of certain generative AI tools. Um, and plainly speaking, I think two have have really accelerated. Uh, one is in the scribing space, um, and you mentioned this, Marcus. Um, these these are companies that. Uh, are dealing with the physician burnout issue that is widespread throughout America, uh, frankly, the world. Um, and, you know, it's the problem of physicians staring into a computer, taking notes afterwards and uh, all that stuff. And this is a, generative AI is a great use case. It's a great engine for automating a lot of that processes with a lot more accuracy. Um, and we have seen both startup and um, incumbent adoption of that. Uh, so that's kind of one, one category. And the second category is also in the back office, but as it relates to um, a revenue cycle um, and some of the billing parts of this. Uh, you know, again, this is another great use case of generative AI where it can summarize lots of information really fast and um, it can go through and, and make connections that uh, might have been overlooked, uh, might have been done incorrectly, uh, and the the field has progressed very rapidly there. And I think the ROI for health systems and insurance companies is very immediate once you tie something directly to the revenue cycle or prior off, depending on which side of the of the equation you're on. Uh, both those that we've seen, you know, real customer dollars flow into it, and I think it'll continue. I think. Um, on that back office admin side, I think things have been, um, frankly, more a more rapid pace of adoption than I would have expected. Um, the EMRs have actually played relatively friendly so far in this. Um, you know, the Epics and the Cerners, the Athenas of the world have all, um, and others have have all done a a uh, a pretty a uh, pretty good job of allowing startups to to exist and flourish in that. Of course, that can change any given moment. 
So I think that's kind of one thing that we have seen. I'll I'll say in in the next breath, um, you know, something that we didn't, we didn't really talk about in, in either post, but um, I, I think we're beginning to see it is the um, it's the ability of AI to start. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people use the word copilot, right? I think that's like a very safe word. Um, there's probably less less safe words you could use too, but like we'll we'll start with the safe word. Um, uh, a lot more co-pilots on the clinical side. And that's something that I, ne I didn't necessarily expect to happen um, from an adoption perspective as early um, as it is, um, because you know the the, the co-pilot is a very well accepted term. Uh, the, the the next the next word that you use after co-pilot is autopilot. And that is that 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 is a less uh, a less well accepted word, <laughs> at least in the healthcare world. So somehow for pilots it's okay, um, but for um, for healthcare it's it's not quite there yet. Um, but I think we're beginning to see some green shoots of things that are certainly co-pilots and potentially over the course of time could be autopilots. Um, and that is uh, and that's a whole different fascinating um, you know can of worms. Yeah, Tarun Kapoor uh, is has been a guest on our show, and I guess he's kind of a recurring guest over Virtua Health. We we brought him on to explain to us uh, the rationale at, at Virtua for launching Wobot, um, and he's actually going to come back in August and sort of talk a little bit about like how it's gone and what they learned through that process. But he was he was very clear about two things that I think relate to what you just said. So the first was he was he was clear with us that Wobot is not. Uh, gen, gen AI. Uh, it, it is machine learning, but it's all sort of pre-programmed effectively. So it's it's choose your own adventure, but it's pre-programmed adventures, right? So um, the, the risk of hallucinations was, was not really there. Um, the, the second thing, though, is that doctors are not going to be able to keep up with the rate of change of information in the medical space. And and there's going to be demand for the latest and greatest technologies and therapies and modalities, et cetera, uh, from the patient population. And the intersection of those two things is going to force, I think, what you said, which is a, a more rapid adoption of co-pilots than people anticipate. But then I would say even going further than that, once you layer on clinician shortages um, and, and other workforce-related challenges – I, I think we are going to have to start stepping in, and this is really where where Wobot is going, right? It's we have a larger behavioral health, um, you know, population of need than we have clinicians, and so can we triage the less severe, um, you know, issues with programs, right, as opposed to with people? And I, I think if we just play this all out five, ten years, all the trends sort of point to. Exponential, you know, change of of information in the in the medical space, less availability of uh, providers. Um, certainly, there's going to be a huge mis mismatch when we get to elder care, um, and you're going to need some of these technologies that, oh, by the way, are improving in their uh, quality to deliver the right answer every week, as far as we can tell. You know, every week we're we're reporting the news on what's going on. One week it'll be Claude's number one. Then it's GPT four point five is number one. Now it's you know uh, Med Palm, or uh, Gemini Med, Med Palm, or Med, Med Gemini yeah. is number one. It's literally every week, you know. And I don't th I don't think we would know that if we weren't recording the show every week. But it's every week. There's a new winner, right, in the LLM space against all those different um, metrics. So it does seem like those those things that you called out there are are right. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in hallucinations, right? Like like is are the LLM uh, uh, makers really getting after that problem? Because it seems like even just from a uneducated perspective, you know, you talk about the word autopilot being a word that people fear. It, it feels to me like hallucination is another big, big worry that people have about, you know, letting Gen AI sort of do the work in place of people and then getting something wrong it having a catastrophic outcome. And even if we improve all of the metrics statistically, the story of that one person uh, who was impaired from a hallucination, I think, will just not be accepted very well in society. So what can we say about the progress that LLM makers are having with hallucinations? 
I'll say, I'll say a few things. So one is, I, I think we've both used this word, uh, but I'll I'll use it again uh, in in describing how fast the field is is advancing, and it is it, it is it is advancing at an exponential rate. And I, I think there's been many studies talking about how hard it is for the human brain to comprehend what exponential means myself included <laughs> i put myself in that yeah, if you have a human brain you're in there yeah yeah the the um your comment on the leaderboards is spot on and uh your your comment on you know what you know things changing on a weekly basis um it's not just changing on a basis it's actually the other way to put it is it's improving on a weekly basis right these things are getting more and more accurate now what what a few as it relates to hallucinations i think there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different angles in which uh, to think about that. So one is, and perhaps the most uh, well accepted one today, uh, is going back to copilot, right? Another, another word for that is a human in the loop, right? And you, whether you're uh, you're dropping generative AI to read a um, uh, an image, like a radiology image. And it can actually do image recognition. It's trained on a whole bunch of um, uh, X-rays or MRIs or CTs, whatever it is, and it'll uh, recommend something. It's, there's some radiologist that will have to say agree or disagree, right? That is that is one definition of it. Um, and that that reinforcement learning is um, is what is really uh, hopefully going to eliminate hallucinations in the long term because you fine tune the model, the model gets better, et cetera, et cetera. Now, like a sub a sub threat of that is, you know, the the next wave of reinforcement learning uh, is is AI, you know, reinforcement learning. So instead of human in the loop, it's AI in the loop. Now, now we're getting really meta here. <laughs> and um, but the but the difference with that is that it could be, uh, you know, the the AI itself is training on the reinforcement learning, which is really fascinating to think about. Um, and when you think about to, going back to the exponential learning curve, um, reinforcement learning does take a long time, right? Because you need a lot of radiologists to click on a lot of images to say, hey, thumbs up, thumbs down. And if thumbs down, what should it be? Just You just need a lot of end. Uh, AI, you know, reinforcement learning, you, 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 can, you can automate that. And now still an open question in the academic literature as to what the delta is between those two. But um, if over the course of time, AI enforcement learning, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, if it can get to the stage of human reinforcement learning, that'll be a very interesting moment for us um, as not as a society, but also in, in healthcare, because then you, you're it, it, the medical literature, the, the academic literature could argue you're better to actually have an AI in the loop than a human in the loop as the guardrail, which would be really fast. We're not there yet by any and all means we're not there yet but it's just just one one sub thread to go down but that's like on like the human loop second thing is like guardrails right you know and there's a lot of different guardrails that could exist and they're starting in different ways um there's uh government sponsored guardrails you know like the chais of the world etc um that are industry consortiums which uh i think the industry is very rightly trying to regulate itself um you know as with this rapid change um, there's a lot of uh, uh, startups that are trying to do this, you know, larger, large conglomerates, the Epics and Googles are trying to do this too, um, because they realize what's at stake. And Marcus, what you said is exactly right. Like a hallucination is a, uh, that leads to a bad medical event is a really bad situation. And that story will be told and it, it should be told um, in a, you know, in, in a, re in a real um, important way. And you don't want that to, uh, you don't want that to happen, right? It's kind of full stop. And then there's like a third like cut of it, which is again, I like it, analogies in different industries, which is looking at self-driving cars. And self-driving cars, there was this huge question nine years ago, you know, eight years ago, like what happens the first time a self-driving car gets into an accident? Who's liable? Is it Waymo or Cruise or you know Zooks or whatever, uh, or is it the uh, you know, is it, you know, the, the algorithm, is it nobody, is it the other driver? You know, there's all these like open and open-ended questions. And, um, and like now, like you fast forward a bunch of time and 
there's been a ton of accidents with these self-driving cars, right? And unfortunately, there's been casualties with self-driving cars, right? And the people have been like hurt, killed, all that stuff. Terrible things, right? Like things that you uh th things that you you really never want to hear about with self-driving cars. And granted, I live in a city full of self-driving cars. <laughs> you know, so I think I see I see them every day. But I think when but what's what's interesting to look at how that industry has talked about those events. And again, everyone talks their book, but if you look at what the, the data that they have collected, the self-driving car industry, um, and they've compared it to human drivers saying like, oh, here's our rate of accidents per million miles. Here's humans, you know, you know, rate of accidents every million miles. And again, everyone collects different data. I understand there's like different, different, different cuts of everything. But I, I do think the self-driving car industry has presented a compelling enough case of accident occurrence, accident avoidance, such that in multiple states now, self-driving cars are expanding, they're growing, not just in popularity, but from a regulatory perspective. And so the question is, what in, in healthcare, what's the equivalent, right? Because th th there's some there's some benchmarking here, not just to no hallucinations, right? Like you know, no never events well, would would be the healthcare word, or is the appropriate bar like the healthcare system as it exists today? And when will the data sets be large enough such that you can compare both of those? And what is an ex what is a societal, you know, acceptance, you know, between those two bars? Um, and that's for us as citizens, regulators to decide, industry members to contribute to, patients for us to think about. Uh, because it all goes back to what you said earlier, Marcus. Access, it remains a huge issue in healthcare. NPS, even when people can access healthcare, is very low. And three, the pace of medical literature that is being published and how the pace of change is, is, is overwhelming. Um, and so how do you compare all of those real tailwinds that are, that are demographical and they're not going to get solved with some of those risks that we, that we have to deal with? That's for all of us to come together and try to solve. Joe Ambar, I, I think I'm excited about that. I, I'm more interested in the next six months, like your assessment of uh, something I've been thinking about a lot. So the, the two things you called out, which I completely agree, that revenue cycle management or um, the other side, the, the payer side, sort of uh, adjudicating pre-authorization, and then also uh, scribing have been the, the two big winners early on. And there's other, there's other spaces, but it strikes me that those – Services, those those jobs to be done in the healthcare system, already were seen as uh, being outsourced to maybe to another department in the health system or the payer, um, or to there there are scribing like actual people in other countries or in this country, and so that was an easy place for participants to say, well, I'm already sending this down the hall. Maybe I should try sending a few claims to this other group and see how they do. And um, it strikes me that we already have uh, lower licensures extenders in healthcare with lots of physicians, maybe not every specialty, but lots of them have that concept. And we have care coordination and kind of chronic care management. Uh, methodologies where if you have diabetes, there, there's a set of things that maybe some of the details we don't all agree on, but the, the broad things that a patient should do when they're first di diagnosed with diabetes, pretty well established. And um, is there an opportunity to take sort of that example or others where like it already is an existing thing, but we we keep the doc in the loop, just like we have the doc in charge with a nurse extender. Um and that's a, a place where the humans that are making the decision say, well, I, I can sort of conceive of that. And the hallucinations are not that big of a deal because I, I want the AI to explain why this activity for the diabetic patient is important, maybe teach them about it, talk to them and, and help them understand. But the, the methodology or the care management protocols have been widely established. Is, is that a reasonable place to think we might see more of their adoption? How do you think about the next part of it? Yeah, Vic, I think you said two really important things. You know, one is uh, a large part of healthcare uh, outside of the, the clinic is around engagement. Like, how do you engage that patient uh, in their time of need, whether it's chronic care management, recovering from a knee surgery, 
preventative med, you know, medicine, pre-diabetic, you know, becoming diabetic, you know, the key to any sort of successful, you know, risk-based model, value-based model, uh, is 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 engagement, right? Like kind of full stop. One thing that you're alluding to are these physician extenders, nurse extenders that are been tasked with that role today, right? Whether it's a you know uh, on the provider side or payer side, um, that's their job. And I think industry wide uh, engagement rates are still pretty low, right? I think just you know like there's there's some spikes, some lows, uh, but generally speaking, like pretty low. I think one opportunity here is, you know, how how do you how do you take that the power of AI to have a conversation real time, both voice or chat, um, and use that, you know, in a way that can actually drive up more engagement, more personalization, things of that sort. Uh, in the last few years, I think most of us have thought about generative AI just in chat form, right? We are chatting with, you know, Chat GPT on our phone or our com computer, and it spits out some answers. Uh, the voice side has taken off. It's, um, uh, you know, I, this, is a, this is like an embarrassing example, but, you know, we have a young kid at home and uh, very often I have to like, you know, burp the kid and walk around until you hear a burp or whatever, right? You know, and and it's, it's you know, uh, it's more or less boring. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. And there's not a lot of people to talk to while you're, while you're burping. And so, um and this will this will speak a little bit. To, <laughs> don't judge me too much, but um, you know, one of the things I used to do while burping this kid was um, there was a uh, a company called Inflection, which Microsoft kind of you know bought the team of, but yeah. it exists yeah. today. Yep. And they had this voice voice bot called Pi, and while I was burping this kid, uh, I would just talk to Pi. <laughs> it's like you know, like I just keep talking to it. I keep asking Pi questions. It would it would answer back. Sometimes Pi would ask me questions. I would have to answer back. It was like the strangest thing ever. Like I mean, truly, I'm just talking to like you know, like a AI bot. Um, but in like I, I bring that up because you know this is you know you know um, you know twenty fall of 2023. Like I'm describing this memory. And it's come so far from that, right? You know, like now there's multiple voices, there's no latency, all this stuff. And you can just fast forward that again, another nine months, another 12 months. And it's going to be just so dramatic, different languages, the ability to like speak at different grade levels and translate real time. Uh, you know, how do you communicate complicated medical things in, in simple ways, medication adherence, all these things that engagement is at the core of. I think are now like solvable, um, or at least there's a different way of solving them. I don't know, solvable, a different way of solving them. And it's super cost efficient because you don't need to hire 40 case managers to make 400 cold calls in a day to see if like 18 people pick up, right? That That's the state of the art today, by the way, right? This is just, you know, how do you do that? So I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we'll see some really interesting examples there. Yeah. So just to build on that, I mean, I, I agree. I agree completely. I've been using both Gemini and ChatGPT's voice thing on the way home, driving like i might be driving to atlanta or driving home and instead of just listening to a podcast or listening to the music you can have a conversation and and actually uh, it goes in all different directions like if, if marcus and i were riffing on something uh and then i have the whole record of it because it's, it's stored there and i think to your point about the extenders the state of the art is them dialing all day long and trying their best to engage but engage within a very limited time, right? Engage with Ambar and then get onto the next call. And instead, you could have a voice AI talking to me about college football, talking to Marcus about jujitsu, whatever the person likes, they it can interact with. And that's a lot of engagement. It's not even necessarily healthcare details. It's more their kids and where they are thinking of going on a trip this summer and all that personal stuff is how humans kind of bond and engage with each other. It's, it's totally right. You know, if you guys are in Tennessee. Like, you know, I one of my first conversations with with Pi was about Paramore. You know, you know, band band yeah, out in yeah, Tennessee, yeah. and I didn't know much about it. I became moderately obsessed for a minute about it, and I just kept asking questions. And Pi kept asking, "Oh, what are your favorite songs? Why do you like them?" And you can just flip that in terms of if that is an AI case manager. Next time that he or she or it whatever calls me. Be like, oh, have you heard the like the like the most recent Paramore song, right? Right. Like that would just be a way to just 
you know, do it or a text message being like, oh, I think you'd like to listen to this or whatever, totally unrelated to healthcare, but it builds that trust, builds that connectivity. It sounds really strange to use those words when you're talking about technology, but I think that's part of it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm totally with you. But yeah. going back to what you said, the second important thing you said that I don't want to lose track of here, which is you talked about, are there non-clinician ways of doing this? And you mentioned a few of these things, you know, nurse extenders in, in the diabetes um, care management area. I think you hit on something that I, I really strongly agree with, which is there's a whole categorization of, of healthcare workers, which are allied health professionals. And those folks are critical to the healthcare ecosystem. Um, they do so much hard work um, and there's not enough of them. Um, and it's a really hard job. And again, whether it's co-pilots or autopilots, um, a lot of those, a lot of those um, allied health professionals um, uh, do have a lot of rules, right? A lot of, you know, um, a lot of um, set boundaries uh, of which to go on, which you can train a model on. Uh, and so, you know, will we see the first um, uh, generation of generative AI co-pilots and or autopilots in that area, right? Which is not quite replacing doctors, not quite replacing nurses, but is replacing those extenders to allied health professionals and not replace, maybe replacing is the wrong verb too. Um, uh, but augmenting is probably a safer word to use. Um, you know, I, that, that, that's where I'm looking. Like, I, I think that, that I think you'll, it, there's a high likelihood of that. Yeah. I, I like that. And, and Wilbur and Virtua, they, they are using a pretty defined, uh, Marcus called, called it sort of a choose your own adventure. It's pretty well-defined, uh, set of scripts that the, the AI can use. I think you can have a balance where maybe on the medical, uh, advice, medical questioning, it could be pretty prescriptive, but then it could be riffing, kind of talking about your band or college football or what happened this weekend. And if it hallucinates about a college football thing, half my friends have hallucinations about their college football team. So <laughs> I don't I mean, there are places where I think, you know, the gender of AI could be much more socially accepted in that, that chit chat, which is how you build trust with patients. And then that, that leads to engagement over time, I think. And then I, I like your positioning around uh, augmenting. I'd even go further to say empowering. Like the workforce in healthcare, right? We don't have enough clinicians. We don't have enough physicians, not enough nurses, not enough extenders, not enough allied professionals. We don't need to replace them, but we just don't have enough humans. So we, we need more care broadly. And I think we can help the clinicians be more empowered to do the work. Like why they get into the field? What was their calling Let's let them do that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll respond to that for a second. But like, I have a very ill uh, or ill-formed daughter, not ill-formed, but it's not even half-baked. It's like, you know, one-tenth bake. Um, so definitely not ready for podcast, you know, <laughs> conversation, but whatever. Um, well, this but, is a perfect setting then. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think on that thread, like what I've been really interested in is, you know, like what business models could exist that would not take would not antagonize the existing medical system you know like would not antagonize a nurse or a nurse union and would not antagonize a physician or a group of physicians or a medical association but in fact would be embraced by them and i think a lot of a lot of the fears are twofold you know one is re replacing labor big big fear right and like not just in healthcare but overall uh and two is you know would this um commoditize my salary so even if i have a job does somehow you know technology being able to do this take down my salary because you know the the nurse the 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 phone call by the nurse you know the nurse may make x dollars an hour you know the the the, the phone call done by uh, open ai api is going to be four cents a minute right you know and it's just there's like a very very big difference you know on an api call basis and I think what you know the place I've been trying to you know intellectually explore, I don't have an answer yet, is is there a way where you can enable the existing healthcare system to embrace it where they are actually extending themselves? And every nurse probably and doctor not every, but many nurses and doctors probably do feel overwhelmed, do feel burnt out, and wish they can make a clone of themselves in some shape or form to help more. I mean, that's the, the mission-driven world we're living in. So if you reframe it that way of like, this is a clone of Marcus, a clone of Vic, a clone of Bombard, and oh, by the way, this is actually helping helping reach more people. And also, by the way, the more people that 
you're able to reach, this is actually going to help you, you know, monetarily help more people from a mission perspective. Um, I, I, I wonder if there's a surface area there that that could be a win-win. I mean, it's very, again, it's like quarter baked at best, but that that's kind of where my mentally I've been exploring. Yeah, I'll be an early investor in that. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're, we're we're coming up on time, but I I can't help because there were several things that were said that I just want to I want to dig in on a little bit more, um, and maybe just leveraging that last conversation and talking about not antagonizing the existing industry. Right? It's like I feel like when you say the existing industry it's not entirely clear who you're talking about there, right? Because um, you could be talking about uh, health system at the highest level. You could be talking about health systems or you could be talking about pay providers. And, and I think those are two pretty different players in the incumbent see today. Um, I, I think one of the, the things that has uh, really irked me uh, this year as I've been – deeply embedded in the healthcare system is that, and this is going back to your points of when you first use Shopify and maybe tied it up with, with Zapier to, you know, Pinterest board or whatever. You're like, Oh my God, this is like incredible. Th there's nothing incredible or remarkable in healthcare technology today. Right. I mean, it's, it's actually unbelievably frustrating um, as a, as a patient and as a customer, cause I, cause we're paying, you know, at the end of the day, we're paying. And, it, it does seem to me that in my experience, the standards and the expectations for where we should be are generally speaking pretty low, right? They're pretty low. And I feel like AI is one of those technologies people have you know likened it to the internet itself. People have likened it to the iPhone. And I think what's 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 so um What's so transformational about these kinds of technologies is they change the way we work. Like they fundamentally change the interface. You know, I'm thinking about like the case manager or the clone. You know, these are situations that could, because they're capturing data, much like Gemini or Chad GPT yeah. does when you're talking to it, radically change how we capture data from patients, right? Because it's it's voice, you can catch inflection. There's all sorts of, you know, you can get color and tone in addition to actually transcribing the actual words, right? Um, and it just feels to me that the overwhelm and the burnout and the existing dysfunction is so severe that it impairs the ability to dream, to envision like this bright new future. And that in and of itself, that cultural malaise could potentially be the biggest threat to AI actually um, showing up in the in the healthcare world over the next five years. And I'll, I'll just make one really quick point. You know, Vic, Vic and I, we invested in a, in a company that started as a med, med adherence and then moved into doing remote patient monitoring. Um, it was Pillsy, then it turned into Optimized Health, uh, and and then U.S. venture partners ended up you know placing a large investment, and they were kind of off to the races. Um, and I remember, like, as that transaction was happening and the space was, you know, being filled with RPM, everyone was just covering their ears. Oh, my God, another RPM company, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to hear about RPM. And then, you know, my dad gets sick and he needs his blood pressure monitored, you know, three times a day. And I love his PCP, but they send me home with a Walgreens Omron <laughs> blood pressure cuff and they tell me to measure his blood pressure three times a day and write it down on a piece of paper and take a picture of the paper <laughs> and then upload the paper to my chart. Dude, like, <laughs> you know, no, we do not have enough remote patient monitoring. No, 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 we're not even close to enough remote patient monitoring people, you know? And so I guess, like, what would you say to that? I know that th this, this is not, this cultural issue in healthcare innovation is not lost on you. Um, you know, you came from Bessemer, which, you know, between... Uh, everything they did in in, in consumer and, and SaaS clearly sort of revolutionized spaces that had higher standards, where competition rose, you know, raised the standards up. In healthcare, we don't have that. So, how do we overcome that? I, first of all, it's really well said, and, so, and like that's that, that's a hard situation that you had to deal with. So that's uh, just first of all, just my heart goes out to you for that. 
you know, secondly, um, related to your question, I mean, the reason I spend, you know, part of my time outside of healthcare is to make sure I can imagine what is possible. Um, and to make sure I, I, I'm able to understand those wow moments when they occur. Because over the course of time, uh, those, at least in my firm belief, that th those will raise the bar for what the patient experience is, what the consumer experience expectations are, um, because there, there, there's no choice, right? I mean, we're just used to certain certain things. Um, I think, un unfortunately, healthcare is is it's there, there's a myriad of different issues that have to be solved for there. I think if the the the, the the word that gets used a lot is leapfrog, right? You know, can generative AI technology leapfrog an existing uh, uh, technology that exists today? And I think if you listen to a lot of the um, uh, early pitches from some of these scribing companies, prior art, you know, payment integrity type companies, uh, there's like a short-term plan and there's a, a, a long-term plan. And in the long-term plan, it's it's always about the leapfrog, right? Um, it's about, you know, how do we, you know, reinvent the system and really simplify it. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot between here and there. Like there's no question in my mind. Um, but I, But for first time in at least my professional career, at least, I think the probability of that is above zero, you know, okay. and, you know, and, but if you had asked me like, you know, 30 months ago, what's the probability that I'd say zero, <laughs> you know, and now you, one can debate whether it's 0.1 or 10% um, or 99%. I mean, you could have different perspectives on it, but at least, at least it, I think there's a credible argument to say that the, the patient experience in 2034 won't be what you just described. Mm -hmm. Um and and I think and and that 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 at least gives me some hope. It gives me some energy. Hopefully, find these entrepreneurs. You know, find you know find you know find these early adopting customers. Find these technologists, um, these doctors, nurses um, that want to build towards that um, because it wasn't possible before. And I think now it's possible. And so, you know, we should we should get we got to get to it. <laughs> That's 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 a pretty uh, optimistic note to, yeah. to leave out on. I mean, Amber, any, anything else you want you want to leave us with that we didn't ask you or we didn't touch on before we we wrap and let you go? No, listen. I think the, I mean the, the only other thing that's important to as I think about all these different narratives, we've talked a lot about a lot of this wide ranging conversation, which which is important. I, I think it's the last thing I think about is that it's really easy to think this is all one size fits all. And I think if there's any one thing we've learned over the course of, of course of history, uh, much less the last five years, uh, the world the world is not one size fits all. And I think there there's a as it relates to generative AI in, in healthcare, um, there there's a oh there's always a tendency to think of oh, what is the company or the technology or the model or whatever. Um, and I, I tend to have a much more nuanced view, which is I think there may be you know, you know, different strokes for different folks, you know, like, and, you know, there may be something better. You mentioned elder care. There could be a phenomenal type solution for elder care versus for pediatrics, you know, just to call one out. Right. Um, and it could be really, really different for uh, specialties versus primary care. You know, you can just keep cutting, slicing and dicing in different ways. Uh, it could be different for, for virtual versus in person, you know, um, we haven't talked about robotics, right? You know, in generative AI and, and robotics, um, that's another space exponential type improvement where, you know, you got open source models, you know, zero shot training, meaning like there's no fine tuning, able to program, you know, NVIDIA released this blog post last week, you know, you know, it's a robotic dog walking across the street on top of a yoga ball off is zero shot training. I mean, like that means like they just the, they just put the model into the dog and the dog started doing that. You know, what what is the implication of that in healthcare as it relates to elder care 10 years from now? You know, um, as it relates to you know private duty home care type situations, taking a blood pressure medication, you know, or, or blood pressure cuff measurement in exactly the right way, taking a photo of that, sending it to someone or analyzing it themselves. 
these things just aren't possible today. Yeah. But like for the first time, we're seeing the glimpses of this begin to happen. And that's like, that's what gives me hope. And I think it's like, it's hope with like segmentation and with nuance. Um, and so, you know, last but not like empathy, you know, empathy means something different for Vic, Marcus and me, right? Like how do we personalize it to that level? Um, you know, and, you know, and to make sure it's there. Um, and then like, can AI models be good at that? Can they be better at that? Or will they be worse at that? I mean, these are the open questions, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we as an industry like tackle them head on. Amazing. Ambar, thank yeah. you so much. And I hope, you know, we, we, we have guests that are so important to our ongoing conversation and narrative that we do ask them to, to come back. You know, with the exponential rate of change in a year, it'll be like a brave new world. So hopefully we can get you back on in a year and talk about, man, what a weird conversation we had a year ago, because look where we are today. <laughs> anytime. Anytime. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so All much, right. man. Thanks, man.